morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is the Don't Let a Good Crisis Go to Waste. Big ideas around the student debt crisis. Uh, I'm Rick Buckingham. I'm with the corporate development team at Strata Education Net Network. I have beside me four very bright individuals that will share some of their uh, innovations that we're trying to accomplish in, in solving the debt crisis. But uh, first, I want to share some stats, and, and some of you have probably heard these before, but just to frame the discussion here. Um, we have over $1.6 trillion in student loan debt today that's weighing down nearly 45 million Americans. Only 58% of undergraduate students graduate within six years of the beginning of their degree. 17% complete associate's degree within three years. In 2018 alone, there were 3.9 million dropouts with $55 billion in debt. Of those student loan borrowers, approximately 40% will ultimately default on their loans. They'll incur additional collection costs and additional fees related to those costs. So this is the thing that you hear about today. And these four individuals are each in their own way trying to solve uh, a piece of that puzzle. So I'm going to go down the line, introduce each of the panelists, and then let them talk three to five minutes each, um, explain what you're doing today, what you might want to do in the future. Um, first to my left is Femi Adebagon, Gun. I, I knew I'd butcher that. <laughs> uh, Femi's with Scholar Me. To his left is Tess Michaels. She's founder and CEO of Stride Funding. And then we have Jim Runcie former COO of Federal Student Aid, but now, more importantly, co-founder and CEO of Education Finance Institute. And last but not least, Tom Wolf. He's founder and CEO of EdAid. So, Femi, I'll let you kick, uh, kick it off, explain what you're trying to do in this area and, and uh, what you might want to do in the future. Sure, I appreciate it. Uh, so, my name's Femi. I run, uh, I'm a co-founder of ScholarMe. And at ScholarMe, we help students pay for their entire college education with a single form. So that means students can apply for FAFSA, every single state aid program, scholarships, loans, ISAs, and other funding sources with just a single application. Um, our goal is like really just streamline the entire way how people pay for school. And in doing so, as we get really good at helping people pay for college, we'll also help them pay for their lives in college. Uh, and our, our take on this is we take it from a FinTech perspective where you should just build financial products that don't let students get themselves in trouble versus uh, hope that students know what they're doing, even though they're coming from a perspective where they have to uh, raise their hand to ask to go to the washroom before and now have to make the biggest financial decision of their lives. So we want to streamline that and cut, all, uh, call up the, cut out all of the confusion for students in paying for school. Great. Um, so I'm Tess, uh, founder of Stride Funding. Uh, we are a student financing company focused on offering income share agreements through a direct-to-student model uh, to graduate students. And you know, this uh, really came about as I was a graduate student thinking about financing options, talking to peers, and realizing that for most graduate students, you already have undergraduate loans. Um, and going back to graduate school is a way to increase your economic mobility and get access to really great jobs. And, um, and oftentimes, it's a very tough choice, given that graduate school has just become much more expensive, as I'm sure many of us realize. And so we really saw income share agreements as an incredible instrument to add flexibility to the financing model and uh, really align interests with students. And when I looked at the income share agreement space, I realized most of the players were either in the coding boot camp space or last mile financing for undergrads. So we were the first to really enter the graduate market and really see both the demand and uptake um, there. And it's been such an incredible journey just helping students with both their financial literacy and really helping them through their career development and, and opportunities thinking through their, their educational choices. So thank you. Great, I'm Jim Runcie. I'm the CEO of the Education Finance Institute. And formerly, I was the Chief Operating Officer of Federal Student Aid. So I resemble some of those statistics that uh, Rick put out. Uh, when I started, the student loan portfolio was uh, the direct por uh, part of the student loan portfolio was 200 to 300 billion. Uh, when I left later on, it was about a billion dollars. Not my fault. Um, I mean, a trillion dollars. Uh, so you know, it, it it really mushroomed, and a lot of that had to do with the um, direct loan program 
um, you know, that uh, the department put in place. But you know, as a, um, a caretaker of the portfolio, you get a chance to see a lot of the issues with, with student debt. Clearly, it's an access tool, and m many people benefit from it. But there's a significant increasing number of people who take out student loans, and the outcomes aren't so good. You know, Rick mentioned 40 percent potential default. Um, and that has significant consequences on the lives of those people who took out those loans who were trying to improve themselves. It also has a significant impact on the federal fiscal interest. So, you know, people were saying that the, the federal student loan programs were, you know, they made money for the, the government, but now they're saying that there's a huge deficit. So it's not helping fiscally and it's not helping, you know, the communities and the students. So, um, you know, I came to realize that there's some structural issues with, with the loan product itself. Uh, we did a lot of things when we were there, you know, under, you know, Martha Cantor and Ted Mitchell and uh, Secretary Duncan to actually decrease cohort default rates. They went down by 20%. You know, we pushed IBR, income-based repayment. Uh, we policed schools. We had more compliance activities. But ultimately, we still had this issue with the defaults, the delinquencies. And then there are people who are still paying, but they're stressed and they're under a significant emotional burden. Um, so after I left the department, um, you know, sort of looked at how I could make a difference in the space because it's, it's you know, when you serve, you still want to continue to do something of value to the many folks that are out there. And income share agreements, and there's been a lot of discussions about income share agreements, but ultimately there are many different levers and ways that you can construct that to make it give you the type of downside protection, mitigate some of the risk, and then also cap the upside so you know, investors and people who support these plans don't you know, make, you know, make it more of an investor tool than a student-focused tool. So uh, anyway, so the Education Finance Institute is focused on four-year programs. Um, which, you know, there have been coding boot camps as a graduate component that folks are looking at, but, you know, the lion's share of debt is within the four-year, you know, um, space. You know, you got billions and billions of dollars. And so that's probably the more difficult problem to solve because it's sort of, it's four years. So, um, you know, so we, we, our goal is to um, be able to create enough data out there so that we can look at the data and make some evidence-based, evidence data-based decisions um, around how to structure these things. Is it good? What are the outcomes like? You know, what kind of refinements can you make? But it's really hard to do that without having a threshold of data that's out there. I mean, there's stuff that's out there, but we just don't think there's a statistically significant amount that's out there right now. Um, and so we, our goal is to have a pilot uh, where there would be a number of schools that would launch uh, these income share agreements, and we would fund them uh, artificially low with philanthropic dollars so that, you know, it's, it's still very student friendly even though we don't uh, have um, the data. Because otherwise, if you funded it without having the data, it would be, you know, so expensive. It would be like sort of equity, right? And so we're trying to avoid that. So uh, with that, let me stop. Um, but, you know, pretty excited about the opportunity, it, you know, of making a difference by looking at it from a different sort of financing perspective. I should just start and say what Jim said. <laughs> Stop and just keep my mouth shut from there. Hi, I'm the Tom. I'm the founder of EdAid. Apologies for the British accent in the room. Um, EdAid effectively um, partners with grad schools and vocational programs to enable students from typically from low income backgrounds um, to attend grad school on a kind of study now, pay later model. Um, all of our payments are income contingent typically, but they're a regulated form of an ISA. Um, we believe we come from the UK, a background from the Financial Conduct Authority, so we take a very high bar to regulation. 70% of our students are first generation immigrants into the UK or US. We expanded out to the Middle East and Australia last year. We'll fund about 10,000 students this year across those territories, um, focused on typically STEM, law and finance, and shifting the kind of um, household GDP of the students we fund. So typical median household incomes of a student we fund are about $24,000 <laughs> pre-study, 12 months of study, and $74,000 post-study. Um, and so for us, our, our main focus really is on that driving economic mobility with the students that we fund. Um, and the kind of way that we'll partner with the school is typically to enable them to grow enrollment for students who would otherwise not be able to attend that program. Um, so a lot of schools and, and um, will look at us as a kind of silver medal of financial aid 
So we're not a scholarship, but we're a kind of more sustainable way of growing enrollment with um, underrepresented students. Okay. All right. Um, as you mentioned, as these folks have all mentioned, they've, they're talking about income share agreements and. Um, you know, income share agreements is just one piece of the puzzle, but it does open doors where the traditional student loan program, especially the direct student loan program, cannot fill a need, especially for those last mile training programs, which we've talked about, or the non-Title IV eligible programs that are out there. But to the panelists, go ahead and give me your perspective on why income share agreements are perhaps a better alternative than student loans. And I'll open it up to all of you. Yeah, so I guess uh, you know, to, to look at it, I think it's not always a one or the other as an option. A lot of times it's coming up with the perfect package for the student. So we're very transparent with students. If you can get scholarships, take scholarships first. If you can get subsidized federal loans, take a subsidized federal loan next. But then when you're looking at private loans versus an income share agreement, the real goal is what is the most cost effective and affordable option for the student and what aligns best with kind of their career outcomes. And so the benefits of an income share agreement is that structurally, everything you pay for is a percentage of income. But with a traditional loan, it accrues interest while you're in school. And when you're earning the least, you're paying a very hefty portion of your income. Whereas with an ISA, it's a fixed percentage of income, so it's always affordable. The amounts you pay flex, and so if you're unemployed or you earn below minimum income thresholds, which all three of us you know, have structures built in place, then students don't owe anything during those periods. So it really aligns well in, in those downside protection uh, causes. The next is just making sure your cost of capital is fair. So I think you know, Jim and I agree, getting um, you know, cost, cost of capital as low as possible through having social impact investors or philanthropic investors is really key uh, to ensure the product is actually very affordable for the student. And then the last piece is really, how do you support the student through aligning incentives and ensuring the best outcomes? So at Stride, we're really big believers in career outcomes and career development. So really having placement agents and resume services and mentorship built into the solution because everyone succeeds when the student succeeds, which in a traditional loan product is just not the case. And so I think structurally, it really aligns incentives in a much better way. Yeah. So no, I agree. I think that you know, the, the alignment is, is, is really critical. I think the progressive structure of the tool, you know, where you know, it has significant downside just because of the progressive, progressive nature of it. I mean, if you th look at the defaults, um, you know, sometimes people say, you know, default, it's a, you know, it, part of it's a graduation problem. And so, you know, you're going to have to have wraparound services and things like that. But even at the graduate level, if you look at, you know, folks who graduate, the default rates over time are supposed to be pretty significant based upon different studies that are out there. And certain groups are disproportionately impacted. If you look at African Americans, you look at first generation, um, and even you know women are getting paid less for the same job. So if you're getting paid less and you paid the same for your education, you now have a higher burden than you should otherwise. So for all these reasons, to have a structure that is flexible enough, um, you know, I think that in the context of people going in to get an education and they have very optimistic views of, of life. But things happen. Maybe you graduate, but you have to take care of an elder parent. You're sort of out of, the, you know, or you decide to go back to grad school. If some, something like that, where it's not a traumatic, it's a decision that you've made, but you don't have the interest accrual, you know, you don't have the capitalization and all those different things that are out there. So um, discontinuities uh, in payments, when you have a principal balance and interest and interest capitalization, it just makes that a tougher form of financing. So. Uh, those are some reasons, there are lots of reasons that we, you know, we can get into and subtleties that, that make this um, a, a vehicle, income share agreements a vehicle that can you know, help a lot of different people. But again, it's a choice, you know, as Tess mentioned, you know, it's not saying you must take this. You know, here's an option, and if you believe that you're, say, risk averse or you, you, or you have different plans in life, this one may be much more suit suitable for you as a, as, as a use case. I'm going to have to disagree slightly. I think um, the, inten We're good at disagreeing. the, 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 inten the intention around income share agreements were, were principally was that a student and their school shared the risk on outcomes and that effectively a school was putting its money where its mouth was and saying, but unfortunately, 
the, the, the current format is effectively putting lipstick on the pig. And it, and it actually, in many respects, limits social mobility. Those that are going after income share agreements have typically explored all their other options that have been either turned down for them, don't have the credit or the FICO score to get them, and therefore they're getting equity-type pricing for what should be debt-like risk. And actually, what you actually do is you actually hamper social mobility in most of the current applications of ISAs. Effectively, you say to a kid from a poor background, you're going to pay two and a half times the cost of your education from someone from a wealthy background. At the same time, the school saying, we have such great outcomes and we believe in our product so much that actually we want to charge you two and a half times the cost of attending. That, that the whole model is fundamentally broken effectively. It's designed to, to, to um, enhance social mobility, but actually it punishes those that have no other option but to take that ISA currently. And so I think that whilst um, we, the intention is right, and I think that there are significant improvements yeah, month on month, we still effectively say for, to a low income student or a person of color or a first generation immigrant, you're gonna pay potentially up to two and a half times to attend this school for someone from a wealthier background. For me, that is just total bullshit. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm actually not. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in agreement with with Tom on on this more so. Like, I think ISAs have a role to play in the world of finance in college. Um, but I, I think like I I'd probably like to first ask like first divorce yourself from the idea of there being a student loan crisis and rather look at it as there's like different components that uh, are intertwined into each other that create what has what we see today. So it's like a, a series of like many crises. Crises, I, uh, you could say. Like you have the college completion cri crisis, where forty percent of students don't actually end up getting a degree, and students are saddled with one to two years of debt with no credentials to actually pay back that debt. You have the uh, crisis of lack of information. For our, our platform, we're very agnostic, and we just show students all of the different options. And and one of the options is our student loans, uh, and we ask the student. For a ten thousand dollar loan with ten percent interest, how much do you think you're gonna have to pay back? And a lot of students say eleven thousand dollars. That's like absurd. <laughs> and so, and so, <laughs> there's like a, a a misinformation problem problem going on there. And then you have the default crisis where uh, a lot of students are not getting access to it, aren't, aren't utilizing like federal safety nets. And many times it's just they don't know. Like being in a space for the last two and two to three years. I myself can't navigate through federal safety net programs. And Jim, I hope you can teach me because. No, I, <laughs> no, I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, so, so uh, a couple of things, and I, I don't think we're in disagreement about this. I think it's a question of what, what the math reveals, right? So, you know, if, if, if someone were to ask you, how long do you think it takes a, a graduating student to pay off their loans on average? And I told you it was 19.7 years. And then I told you, well, OK, so I take out 10,000. How much do you think I'm actually going to pay over time? Is it going to be 1.5? Is it going to be 2.0? Or is it going to be closer to over 2? Right, so, so when you look at the facts and you say, uh, well, am I really potentially impairing those low income and you know, sort of you know, uh, less advantaged populations? Maybe not. But what you know you'll get is you'll have the flexibility and the peace of mind um, to go to work knowing that you, you're limited to a certain percentage of your income. And for some folks, that's important, right? You've mitigated your risk, and, and, and that's important. Um, you know, and, and this whole issue of sort of, you know, household formation, asset accumulation, and all those different things, it's kind of hard to do when you've got, you know, a fixed obligation or a student loan that's accruing interest. And so, you know, there's certain social justice issues that surround this as well. So I think we're in agreement. I think the, the question is sort of how do you construct it so that it's more student focused than it is investor focused? I'm sorry. And then as, as Tom mentioned, you know, how much skin in the game does the institution have, right? Or, you know, and, and that's, those are things that with more, dish, more data uh, that is available, you know, there could be a measure of accountability, there could be a measure of alignment, the schools could play a ro role, the capital markets could play a role, but before all of that is said and done, you kind of need to make sure that it's a data-based, you know, decision that you're making, and there just isn't enough data right now. Um, you can look at it, and the concept works in many ways, and it's hard to sort of fight the concept, but, you know, people want data. I remember saying, hey, look, just look at the, student loan portfolio, we got tons of data and we know, you know who defaults and we know all these different things. 
but you know, until it's actually until it's actual data versus proxy data, because that's really just proxy data, right? Till you have actual data around it, then it becomes a lot more um, difficult to to make a case for or against. I think, I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said genuinely schools need to keep skin in the game. Effectively now what happens is a school will typically sell off, sell off its ISA portfolio 30 days after it originates at fairly lousy economics to the school. Um, and and, and that will typically go to a third party capital provider. And as a result, actually the school doesn't get a great deal out of, out of the mix. They get some cash flow. And, but actually if they, if they went to a normal you know, debt factor, they get much better rates just on those receivables anyway. Um, and so what happens is that they have to push the envelope constantly on the students to, to, to even just get to that data, which means typically those who, who you're effectively using hardworking, you know, everyday people trying to build a better life as your guinea pigs to work out what your financial model is. And that's cool for a bunch of us sat in suits here behind desks, but actually there's everyday real people out there who are, who are just trying to build a better life. And actually, there's, there's about 100 million of them, right? right. You know, it's, it's not a small space. And so I think fundamentally, I think if we can get back to basics and stay really true to that North Star of, of income share, that schools share outcomes risk with their students, you know, pound for pound, dollar for dollar, um, I think actually the, the, the um, and yes, of course, they can potentially look at some third party or tertiary risk structuring for cash flow and other elements. But that shouldn't be, you know, when you get behind the scenes on this, it doesn't look pretty for anybody. Um, and so yeah. really there needs to be a better way of doing this. Right. Scale will help that for sure. Well, but um, I just think we can all do a, a better yeah. job. No, and I would just add in, I think, A, when you talk about pricing, I think, you know, Jim's right, one of the biggest battles is really doubling down on uh, getting as large of a data set as possible and nailing the pricing because the uncertainty around pricing is what, you know, enlarges the pricing a lot more for students. So if, if each of the ISA players really allocates their time towards building the best data sets, collaborating on with the schools to get anonymized data and really ensuring that pricing is as tight as possible, A, that helps the student, and B, I think initially in the ISA market, if you go back a few years, it was early adopter investors that were supporting this, that were traditional investors that expected fairly high returns, but you're seeing a lot of impact investors moving into the space to ensure that bad actors don't take advantage of A, low regulation, and B, the fact it's a new product that requires financial literacy from students. And so over time, you're actually seeing the pricing come down quite a bit. And a lot of students, we see this in the grad space, you know, they have undergrad loans, they're continuing to accrue interest, and debt is not a good standalone product. And I always go back to the mortgage example of, you know, when you get a mortgage, you do it with a mix of debt and equity, and ISAs are that flexibility in the package. And so I think, actually, the product itself, if backed with the right players and priced appropriately, is a good comparable to what you, you get in the market in the debt piece, but with a bit more support and flexibility for the students. Yeah, and I think it's important for all of us here is that income share agreements are still in their infancy. So when we start talking about uh, caps and that it's still being worked out, I know it's alarming when you see two and a half times your amount you took out to borrow. But if you go from a $20,000 a year job to $100,000 a year job, I mean, you really have to succeed in your career in order to hit that cap. So I think it's a little premature to say that a 2.5% cap is unfair. If it works out for the student that takes out that ISA and gets that job, that creates that 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 better socioeconomic status that they have. So, but I think we're all tweaking to find out where that magic number is, and it's going to vary by institution, by program, um, through you know through, through the offerings of that. And so I think you know income share agreements have the potential to weed out bad actors from a school perspective. They have a potential to weed out bad actors from a you know, financing perspective because the incentives are more aligned and I think we've talked about that. Do I have any free college advocates in the audience? Got one, two, all right. Um, you know, you heard our panel talk about skin in the game for the school and, and this is Rick Buckingham's opinion, not that necessarily of Strata Education Network because we are agnostic in that regard. But I believe when you talk about free college, where's the skin in the game for the student? Um, so I'm not a big proponent of that, but I will meet you guys halfway, and I think there's a way to solve some of that debt crisis through, um, well, let me back up a little bit. You, you were talk about, um, you know, 40% will ultimately default on their, on their student loans. The vast majority of those are, you know, first or second year students, or they're ones that never complete their education. So they're never going to move up that ladder without that credential. Um, but how can we 
solve that so they don't have that debt, let's front load Pell. It's students that are juniors and seniors, maybe they don't need Pell. We double the amount they get in their freshman and sophomore years. That covers most of their tuition and cost to go. They come out, if they don't complete, they have no debt. Um, you know, likewise, you know, for um, you know, students that are further down the path, we need to do a better job of financial literacy in the K through 12 space. Far too many students are borrowing way too much for their education than they need. Um, we need to get real as, as a society to address those kind of concerns. We need to teach students um, when they're younger. You know, the, the, the most frustrating part for me as a father is I had two kids go through a very good high school and uh, school system where I live. Their total exposure to personal finance was a two week course during their whole 12 years. Mm -hmm. That is wrong. We need to do something about teaching folks how to manage money, and it needs to be part of the curriculum in the K through 12 space. So I'm running out of time, so <laughs> I am going to, <laughs> you guys got my diatribe, I apologize for that, but I have to get on my soapbox every once in a while. Um, yeah, no, I'm gonna no, turn no, it over no. to Martha Cantor. Yes, hi. Hi, yeah, it was oh, yeah. one of the two that raised, raised my hand, but remember, free equals paid for. Someone's <laughs> gonna pay for it. And I appreciate the conversation uh, from, the, from the panel because this is a complex issue. I look at federal student aid, having worked with Jim for quite a long time. He was my boss. Uh, <laughs> as, <laughs> as, you know, I'll, I'll use a John Muir uh, quote, you know, everything's connected to everything else. So Pell Grants, you want them front end loaded, what do you want on the back end? How is the entire loan program and the grant program going to work together? Um, we do need a better fix on all of it, but to pull out ISAs, which is the topic of this panel, you know, what's on my list at night when I worry about the student loan program is, will low-income students be able to do better than they're doing now with any of the innovations that are up there? So what keeps me up at night is there isn't a regulatory environment for this, so it really has been a wild west for the last few years since we started this conversation, but I follow uh, Australia and I follow the UK, so you know there are whole countries that have operationalized this. Um, they haven't had no unintended consequences, but they've been at it for a long time, and they have a regulatory environment. We do not. And we have also historically made a lot of, we have further problems because we haven't simplified what got started in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, for example, you know, taking out the questions on the programs and giving students bottom line, especially the students that I focus on most, if we can help those students, we can have these kinds of solutions working well for all. Uh, but really helping those students with the financial education that they don't have. And it's all of our faults, it's not anyone. So my question is, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up is no regulatory environment, creaming the high, you know, the high performing schools and the high performing students in the designs that have been out there historically for the last five to 10 years. So how, do, how, do, how does that affect it? Um, and also other unintended consequences that you might be thinking of. Because I'd like to know what keeps you up at nine and then I'll turn this over to my so, partner. <laughs> uh, so first of all, thank you Dr. Kanner for all that you've done for Pell students and low income students. When uh, Dr. Kanner started as the undersecretary, I think we had six million people um, you know, receiving Pell. When she left, it was like nine million people receiving Pell. So you know, she just doesn't just you know, speak it, she, she, she walks it. And so, uh, thank you for that. And now that you've given us a hard question. <laughs> uh, so, so, there, so there are two things. One, I think the first, is, you know, there's sort of two sort of, I think, you know, big issues. One, I, I, I was focused on the data, but the other issue is what you pointed out, sort of making sure that there's a, a, a statutory and regulatory framework that um, protects um, low income and any student that takes these things out. Um, and there is, and that's another one of the work streams that we're focused on. So we're, um, you know, uh, over the course of the next few months, we're going to have convenings. We're we're talking to, um, you know, various people because we want to make sure that, uh, independent of that, we do things that protect students. So whether it's adherence to the, you know, uh, debt collection, 
service member relief acts. Um, there, there are a bunch of laws that are out there and frameworks that are out there that we can take up on ourselves and include those within the agreements that we put out so that um, we don't create um, issues within the market because I think if people look at it and there's bad experiences outside of a legal framework, people will stay away from it. But we ultimately want a legal framework and a regulatory framework because then we don't have to worry about you know, um, you know, bad actors or bad outcomes uh, or making it um, you know, more investor friendly than student friendly. So, um, so yeah, we are focused on that. And um, I think we have to sort of police ourselves until that framework is out there. There, there is a bill that's there that has some protections built into it. It has model disclosure forms where you know, you, you know, it's sort of financial literacy, transparency stuff that, that should help. But you're right, that's something that's going to need to be addressed. Yeah. Um, I, th I think you, you highlighted two really great examples of the UK and Australia where there is, there's already existing regulatory framework and, and what we did was we built income contingent payment or ISAs to fit that framework. I, I'm just baffled that we sit in a room where yeah. we're trying to move, with very people far brighter than me, where we're trying to move the Senate to make new legislation when we already have a regulatory framework yeah. that protects consumers. And it's, it just, it seems crazy to me, the reason why typically we're doing it is because we don't want all the framework. We don't want all the protections. We don't want all of the uh, disclosures. We want to pick and choose the ones that we want and then carve out the bits that don't allow us to do state nursery regulations or don't allow us to do things. And I think, quite frankly, that you know, we've rolled out across the US as the, maybe it takes someone from outside the system coming in and seeing it with a fresh pair of eyes because yeah. we have a regulated income contingent payment plan. We protect consumers. We, we d disclose to all tailored disclosures in state. We comply with all fair, lend fair credit collection and practices and everything else. And I just think that it, it, I find it baffling that we're trying to find shortcuts on regulation everywhere along this thing to, to effectively increase the financial return of these products rather than saying, how do we protect the consumer? Because if you protect the consumer, you protect the school. And if you protect the school and those two funds, you make plenty of cash. There is so much money to be made in this space. I don't think anyone should be worried about the financial returns here. People should be worried about how do we drive better outcomes for our students and protect our students first and foremost. If we do that right within the existing legislation, we don't need to have Senate bills. We don't need to be lobbying left, right, and center and moving people around. I agree with everything, except we're a 501c3. We're not trying to make any money. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, no, but I, I completely agree. I think the, regula the regulatory tailwinds are, are very strong right now, and, and it's really important to just align this as you would a traditional private loan and not think of ISAs as completely different instruments and um, be very focused on consumer protections. And I think for, for me, one of the things that really keeps me up at night is this is a really nascent industry, and so each player in the space has a really big impact on shaping the product and, and impact the industry and so one bad actor really puts the space at risk and so uh, it's a really special space where each of us instead of being competitors have actually become collaborators I have never seen an industry where we get on calls together and we talk about what's the common language that we discuss our terms and how are we doing our contracts what should this look like and that's really special and so for each of us I think it's continuing that as the space grows and um, continuing to really stay strong on keeping the student first so yeah, as, as I think about like what keeps me up at night uh, at Scholar Me, our North Star is just students and focusing on what's best for the student no matter what. Um, and we've seen, because a lot of students come to us as like the last option that they have, and we've seen students that we didn't respond to in three days drop out because they weren't able to access various funding sources. And so it's something I'm constantly thinking about on a day to day basis. And I think like what I'm worried about when it, when it comes to unintended consequences is like this problem is so multifaceted that I, I fear that a lot of people look at ISAs as a silver bullet when Absolutely. more so it's uh, just another tool in the arsenal. Good point. Um, and so it's like something still focus on college completion rates, still need to be focusing on lowering default rates, still need to be focusing on how do we get information out to students in the best way possible for them to actually make uh, proper and good good decisions for themselves um, and, and there's a lot of different ways and opportunities in doing so and ISAs are just one of those those ways of doing so and, and Martha to finish that up what keeps me up at night is I have two kids in college now <laughs> the cost of putting two kids through college is is extraordinary um, and that's you know in my home state Purdue 
uh, Mitch Daniels and what he's done at Purdue and keeping costs low is a phenomenal story. And all the institutions out there should look at his model, copy that model, because the cost of education is way, way out of bounds for what it should be. And that's you know what I'd love to see get addressed. Daniel, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to ask a different question at the end of this, because I think the conversation has gone in such a fascinating direction. I uh, started investing in student loans in about 2008, 2009. The first fund I actually raised was a student loan fund, shockingly, after the crisis. And I, I you know, the, you, you, may, you may remember back in 2008, there was a financial crisis, and you could buy federally guaranteed student loans at like 80 cents on the dollar. It was a shocking point in time in history. And I forgot about it for a while until um, I, I picked up the New York Times one day, and they, you know, education stories don't usually make the New York Times. I thought Arnie Duncan's comment last night was very mm -hmm. apropos there. Uh, and, but on the front page of the New York Times was, you know, student loan debt hits a trillion dollars. I was like, what happened to this industry? And, you know, some of the people here were, were there for it, and I, we don't need to get into the history, but I said, there's got to be a different answer. And I spent about a year or two researching different solutions to the problem and ended up at, at ISAs. Um, but I don't think ISAs, to the point that was just raised, are the, the only answer. Um, we've ended up funding a number of ISAs. We're probably one of the largest funders of ISAs directly through various funds that we operate. Um, and uh, I, I, it's really a, a tool in the toolkit because the fundamental problem is college is just too, too costly. I keep on remembering the guy who ran for governor of New York who would go and say, the rent is just too damn high, right? And the cost of college is too damn high. And anybody who's sitting here and not, and I don't, I don't think we've spent enough time saying, okay, where are we going to drive down the cost? That's a, next time, Deborah. Um, uh, but what I, what I want to say is we're funding ISAs right now. And I, I have to take one very serious issue with the comments from the panel. We absolutely need ISA legislation to protect the people that people on this panel want to protect the most. And let me give you one very simple example. If you forgive a loan under current regulations, you have to pay taxes on that. The very premise of an ISA is that if you don't make enough money, that money goes away. That money is forgiven. Under the current rules, the way if, if an ISA was considered debt, you would actually owe taxes. So you go to your lowest income people, most at risk, and you say, oh, you didn't, you didn't make it. You still owe the taxes on, on that loan. So I think that's a very simple, very specific example where the current regulatory framework doesn't work. I'm a little bit of a cynic, even though I'm in Washington, D.C. today. And I'm not sure that our great senators and congressmen and president are going to come together to get ISA legislation passed. No one laughed at that, except for Matt. Thank you. <laughs> I, I thought it was fun. Uh, but we're struck in a very interesting position where we actively want to finance ISAs. And we find ourselves in a position where every day we're fighting the fight that's effectively on this panel, which is we want to put in place things like the school has to retain a first loss piece. We want to put in place specific caps. So assuming there's no regulatory framework that develops, what should private capital providers like ourselves and the people on this panel, what are the specific three or four things that we as an industry, in the absence of federal regulation, can do to, to, to make sure there are no bad actors? Because I think Tess's point is exactly right. The thing that kills this industry is a bad actor. So what can we as private capital providers, operators of ISA businesses, what are the two or three things we can put in place ourselves that will ensure no bad actors? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, people talk about financial literacy and everything else. I think having a model disclosure, I, I know it's in there, people talked about it, where people know exactly what the mechanics are if I make this much, here's what it looks like um, at different income levels. Here's what it looks like at different incomes compared to the loans that are out there. Um, you know, because no one wants to, you know, the, the worst situation to be in is, is for people to feel like they were hoodwinked or took out something and it wasn't what they thought it would be or it was worse than they thought it would be. And so uh, that, that's just one item. I, I will say, though, that, you know, having... Um, been at the, you know, Department of Education, you know, one of the top questions that our call centers get, you know, we got like call centers that service 45 million people. One of the top questions is, what's my account balance? Why do you think that's the top question? Because people don't understand amortization, negative amortization, interest, capitalization, 
And so people say, you know, ISAs, you know, that's another whole complexity. It's actually so much simpler than any financial literacy around sort of loans. People just, and, and I get it, you know, no one runs around with a bond calculator figuring, okay, this is the interest component and this is the principal component of, of the payment I made. But, um, you know, so I think the financial literacy component and the disclosure component, you know, would really help, um, you know, from us getting a situation where people say, I just don't understand what, what I got into and, and, and it becomes problematic. And there are lots of other things, so I'll shut up, but that's just one. Well, I think um, but there's status quo bias. I think that's the issue. People know what yeah. loans are. So there's a status quo bias that says uh, everybody else is taking out loans. Loans have always been here. This might be a better project or not. I don't know. But I'm going to stay within the status yeah. quo. And that makes it a little bit more difficult. I think, uh, just, yeah, I think yeah, I'll go real quick. Uh, outcome data, Daniel, I think, is what's going to be critical. We need to prove that the students that are taking out ISAs that are going to these programs are materially better off once they've completed that program. So we all need to do a good job of, of, of making sure those outcomes exist for those students and then demonstrating them to the, the detractors or what have you. So Tom, I think you had something. Mm. Uh, just very quickly, three things. One is that we need to ban all language from schools that use the words free, pay nothing. Um, uh, because effectively they're, they're mis-selling effectively a product which is a financial instrument. So I think the first thing has the school can, the, the language around that. If it was a regulated product, they wouldn't be able to use terminology like pay nothing and free, which is still being used across virtually every, every operator of an ISA. Um, the second one is that we should probably adopt TILA 18, 19, and 20 in terms of disclosures. They're the closest thing to um, you know, fair um, kind of um, disclosures around cost and use the cost of ISA and equivalent you know, debt-based products in that. And then I think the third one is that we should be transparent. If most of the kind of players in this space talk about transparency and yet they won't share if they're sharing risk or selling down the ISAs, their economics. So if they, if they say that and a student understands exactly where the value chain is, we're talking about adults here who are doing STEM and finance and law and um, you know, great courses, they can handle it. So tell them the details and let them make the decision with all the information. I think we are now out of time, I, I know, but uh, the panel will be around, so if you have other questions, uh, feel free to reach out to them, and I want to thank all of you guys for being here. Thank you, guys.